Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning in Australia and good evening uh, for Angela <laughs> that she's joining uh, remotely from the US, I think. Um, thank you uh, for joining us virtually today. Um, first, I want to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land and waters of the place where we are living and working, uh, the non awal people, and all Aboriginal elders past, present, and future. My name is Claudia Munera. I am a Colombian researcher based at the Fenner School. And it is a pleasure for me to introduce Angela Posada Swafford, who is going to deliver a very interesting seminar today on Colombian amphibians. We're very excited, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Colombia is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. Um, but our rich biodiversity and the multiple values associated with our biodiversity are being threatened by multiple drivers of change including deforestation and climate change and among other things. Um, at the Fenner School, uh, we have been engaging in this, delivering these seminars and communicating conservation research, not only from Australia, but also from other countries. So, and alongside with the Colombian Embassy in Canberra, we have been delivering these seminars about biodiversity and conservation in Colombia for a few years already. So thank you so much to the Ambassador Atortua um, <clears throat> and to all the staff from the Embassy in Canberra for connecting and inviting um, Angela to deliver the seminar today. Angela is, um, Angela Posada Suafor is an award-winning Colombian-American scientist with an international career as um, has been researcher and science in science research, science and science communication. She has participated in many international research expeditions and has been writing stories on environmental subjects for about 30 years in different media platforms and is both Spanish and English and able to communicate and engaging with different audiences. She has been a speaker in TEDx and is engaged in giving public talks at Colombian embassies throughout the world on diplomacy of science and communicating science. Um, some of her recent awards include the prestigious uh, Simon Bolivar Prize, which is the Colombian's top uh, journalism prize. She was the first Hispanic journalist to receive the Knight Fellowship in Science Journalism at uh, MIT Harvard. And she was had a very important role in connecting Colombia's Antarctic program, the National Science Foundation, and the Arctic programs of Chile and the United States. And she has also been a team member of those uh, some of those expeditions, which is very exciting to have her today. Um, we have a very rainy day today in Canberra, uh, which seems that it's quite adequate to talk about frogs today. <laughs> so I welcome you, Angela. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Claudia, thank you very much. It's very rainy today here in uh, Miami Beach. Um, so imagine, I mean, it's already night, but uh, thank you also to the embassy and to the Fenner School. I'm delighted to get to meet you guys and to talk to you a little bit about a very special little kind of, of a class of amphibians that I fell in love with when I did a story for National Geographic magazine last year. So, uh, Claudia, perhaps we can, I can just share a, um, some photos and we can talk and then you can uh, jump into the conversation anytime and then we will be delighted to receive questions from, uh, from our audience. Uh, Thank you. So let me go into sharing the screen. And, uh, and we'll take it from there. Let's see. And there we go. So look at this guy. <laughs> uh, as I say, it has nothing to hide. Uh, this, this is a glass frog. Uh, from Colombia, they also live in the across the neotropics that is Ecuador and Peru and um, some countries in Central America. But the the southwest part of Colombia seems to be like a hot spot, and therefore also the north of Ecuador. So uh, this photo was taken by a wonderful Spanish photographer who did the photos for the story. Uh, his name is Jaime Culebras. Culebra in Spanish means snake. And he changed his last name professionally, he says, because he loves amphibians. <laughs> but anyhow, eh, 
this map is showing us the uh, well it's actually showing us the, the amphibians uh, distribution in the americas uh, and uh, as you can see here there are over 8000 uh, almost 8500 species of amphibians in the world that is frogs toads uh, obviously salamanders and then there is this little thing that looks like a like a worm, but it's not, it's called a Cecilia, eh, because they do have tiny vertebrates. It's just amazing. Eh, the bottom line is that Colombia eh, has, eh, because it's so biodiverse and because of all these regions and many eh, um, ecosystems eh, hidden in all these little folding of the mountains, it has uh, the world's second highest diversity of frogs. Mm, it has 734 species of frogs, but it has a lot of species of glass frogs, which is more than half of the total number of glass frogs in the world. And, and the glass frogs are just absolutely uh, breathtaking. I, I, I didn't know anything about them until I started researching this story. And uh, it turns out that uh, some of them hang out in the north of Colombia, in the uh, Atlantic coast, uh, which houses the highest mountain range, the highest coastal mountain range in the world. Here you cannot really see, there's no peaks. It's, it, it's, they're not in this image, but this gives you an idea, well, of the, of, of the incredible jungles that uh, you have in that spot. Uh, very dense jungles, still healthy, still, uh, Virgin, some of them are secondary forests, but a lot of them are primary forests. And uh, they are really revered and taken care of by the indigenous communities that live there, the Tyrones, which uh, uh, have a wonderful uh, relationship with nature, which we need to learn from. Um, so, Last year, the government of Colombia called me to be the general editor of this wonderful book, which you see there, which if you can see me in the image here, look how big, it's a big coffee table book designed to be given to nature tourism guides in Colombia. But of course, it has an online component or version, both in English and Spanish such that the guides who are taking tourists to any of these wonderful places can download the thing on their phone and they can just tell the, the tourists all sorts of important but abbreviated information and illustrated information about uh, not just the creatures, animals, different kinds of animals in Colombia, but uh, uh, plants and uh, geological formations and the reasons for biodiversity, as well as an ethics for those people who are nature guides. Because sometimes some of those guides, um, you know, you go to places in different parts of the world and they, they just talk without giving you any important information or they just talk without uh, really giving you a sense of, of, the, of the greatness of nature or, and, and the urgency for conservation. So this book, I highly recommend it. You will get a beautiful knowledge, it's free, uh, uh, a great knowledge about Colombia and its ecosystems. And so what I did is that I uh, took all the scientific literature and put it into, into pretty, pretty texts so that without losing any science rigor that you could understand and really enjoy it. And in the course of that book and in the course of the story, uh, I learned that there have been recent amazing advances in molecular biology, in, in genetics, in optics, in physics, to learn about these amphibians. Look at this picture, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you can see the ventral vein uh, of, this, of this animal. You can see this is the liver apparently right here, according to the, to the researchers. In the first photo, you could even see the eggs of that female. And something quite amazing is that you cannot really see the bones. You know, you can hardly see the bones. So what is this game of transparency? What is it for? How, how, how exactly it was developed? How do they use it? 
and how is it being studied? So the latest in research is trying to understand how they evolve this thing. And as it says in this text, they, the baby frogs rearrange, literally rearrange, they change actively their insides of their cells so that when they are grown ups, they are not visible. It's like the Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility in a way. So what happens is that in rearranging these tissues, they, uh, they make it possible for light not to be scattered as much. And when light is not scattered and it is not absorbed, then it passes through tissues like nothing, you know, like completely freely. And therefore you cannot see the tissue itself. It's uh, transparency is a very rare trait in vertebrates who live on land. It is very, well, it is common in the sea. Remember, just think of the jellyfish, for example, or think of certain insects um, that are most, mostly transparent or some butterflies that have transparent wings, but a vertebrate uh, on land is rare. Um, so researchers think that maybe there is this liquid or fluid inside the cells or between cell and, and the next cell that has a substance that uh, allows light to travel without being impeded or, or hindered by anything. And the, the more obstacles the light encounters when it hits an object, the more opaque that object becomes. Uh, so that for me, it's just incredible. It still is not well understood, um, but it is all about photons and energy and light. And, uh, and this is just one of the most active areas of studies in amphibians uh, in general, in glass frogs specifically, everywhere. Uh, then you, so you have the transparency, no? But then you have the other thing, which is their green pigment. <laughs> And the green pigment uh, acts as, as, according to these researchers, as a biological mirror. Why? Because it, this one does the opposite. It scatters the animal, the, the light that reaches the animal, but in a different way that other animals do this. I'm sorry, this is getting technical. It's the only technical part I will have in this talk. But what it does is that the animal has a, like a peptide, like a, a chemical substance inside its cells that is greenish bluish and that in, in high concentrations it is poisonous for most people and plants and things. But the animal makes it in such a way that it uses that chemical and, uh, and then the light, when it reaches the, the frog, it kind of glows. So under, under the nocturnal light, not always under light like this. But anyhow, that's one of those incredible things about these frogs that I learned. Then I learned something that I like, the, I like even more, <laughs> which is that the males are, you know, stellar, stellar parents. Mm, they, um, they care for the eggs. The females normally lay their, their eggs and they don't, they don't care anymore. They just do them the favor and leave, <laughs> uh, perhaps to look for another boyfriend. So it is up to the parents to sit on, on this clutch of eggs. Uh, she lays between 50, you know, between 20 to 100 eggs, depending on the species. Uh, and then this male sits on top of this clutch of eggs for weeks and days at a time, like a, a, a hen on on the, on the eggs, uh, but it is not that easy. This male reminds me of the penguins, of the emperor penguins in Antarctic in a way that it, it has to go without food, without drink, without anything. But what it does before sitting on this clutch of eggs is that it goes to where the part of the leaf or, or another part of the leaf that has, um, that has water and the male frog absorbs water as much as it can through its belly or through its urinary tract. 
researchers don't know which don't know yet which of those two organs do that but then it sits as it sits on the on the clutch of eggs it starts releasing this humidity on the babies and maintains them um, humid which is the the key for for days and uh, and so notice also the beautiful pattern this is a reticulated um, glass frog uh, that is clearly it seems to me is a uh, confusing um, a predator in thinking that maybe this animal uh, instead of is, 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 is the eggs. So the, a predator, a snake, would attack the frog and not the eggs. And uh, it's just uh, absolutely beautiful. Mm. So this here uh, is uh, a newly discovered uh, um, frog. It's in Ecuador, but it is highly suspected that it will be in the southwestern part of Colombia because it's the region is very similar. And uh, researchers were telling me, we don't know what happened in, during the evolution of frogs, of these frogs. But at some point, the females were the ones who were taking care of the babies, of the, of the eggs. And then suddenly, a few million years ago, around between eight to 25, the whole thing changed and the, part, the care went from the mother to the father. Why? This is one of the reasons, one of, the, one of those questions that, that uh, researchers really want, like to ponder at. Maybe the females um, discovered that they needed more time or more energy devoted to producing more eggs. And so therefore they, don't, they cannot take care of the babies. Who knows, could be. Uh, so, so, but, but these frogs actually evolved a long time before that, like no, almost 50 years ago. This is a short video by the Smithsonian. Look how nice of, of a female laying, it, it doesn't have any sound, laying its eggs and the male uh, fertilizing them. Uh, right the minute that she lays them. And look, look at where they are, at the very tip of a leaf. And uh, I'll tell you why. The eggs have to be laid, or ideally laid at the very tip of the, of the, of the leaf. So here he is beginning to, he's already taking his position on, the, on his clutch. And so this is an, an, another, another video of, this male defending uh, from the clutch from, from, uh, from a spider. They are very devoted again, not only they cannot eat or drink, <laughs> they have to defend. <laughs> and soon it has to go back and sit on top of them because by now, oh, here we have a little bit more sound. And look at what the researchers are trying to prod them and, and give them hell. <laughs> to see if they move and they, and they won't move. No matter if they've been attacked, they won't move. They are even inserting a little, a little needle just to, to see what, what this poor dad does. And it's just uh, amazing. <laughs> I think he's trying to gather some of the so some of the yeah of the jelly that the <laughs> that goes around okay so that's one thing but then there's another more interesting thing oh, oh it's really funny that is also new knowledge which is that okay you have the the mated male the the one who already has a wife a girlfriend and then you have a bachelor that wants to wants to see how the trick is done well bachelor males in in a lot of glass frogs have discovered that if you look, if, you, if they find um, a clutch of eggs that is unattended, that probably the parents are dead or probably who knows what happens, then he thinks, okay, I'm going to deceive a possible female into, into thinking that I am a devoted um, father in, in, in the wedding because she will see that I am there taking 
like guarding the clutch of eggs. And at some point, something cool happens is that the females who are sitting on the nearby leaves, they begin to find this male as a very attractive male because they think, oh, this guy is an experienced father. And even though those are not his eggs, look how, how uh, you know, implicated he seems to be. Um, Sometimes, some, some of that somehow it brings to my mind uh, the case when you go to the park and you see a guy just taking the dog for a ride. A lot of the girls just want to kind of thinking, my thinking, you know, this guy, oh, look how cute he is. We take the dog out, let's go have a conversation with him. So somehow uh, this deception is really funny in these animals. And it is, uh, it's like, uh, knowledge that began began to be acquired about a year or two ago. Uh, and so the, of course it needs a lot more study, but it seems to do the trick. Uh, it's not just location, but it is the behavior of these males that entice the females. <laughs> so that's something really funny that I that I saw, that I learned during the story. And, and then the thing is that, uh, there is in Colombia this beautiful frog in the northern Sierra Nevada, you know, the highest mountain, coast, coastal man, mountain range in the world. She is one of the very few um, glass frog, fem female glass, glass frogs that actually takes care of her babies. She's just hugging them for dear life and uh, it's rare and they don't know why and they don't know why these species or why in that mountain range, what makes this giant glass frog? And by giant, I mean this, because these normally glass frogs are the size of a paper clip, like this. What compels her and not the males to take, to take care of her? Now, there's so much to learn. And the reason that the eggs are, the ideal location of the egg is of the clutch of eggs is at the, at the tip of the, um, of the leaf is because when they uh, mature a little bit and they become tadpoles, they need to fall down into a stream, into a little stream. And so all those leaves that are overhanging a stream are the perfect real estate that a male that wants to be really successful has to find. Otherwise, it will be difficult to move the eggs from the top of the leaf down to the, to the tip. This photo I love. It was taken by, by photographer Jaime Culebras. He won a, a world award of, um, of photography. And it's just, that's the tip of a fern. You can clearly see about to drop all those babies down into the big world, intimidating world. Of, of the stream where they will find, of course, more enemies. A stream that can be a little stream or a very big stream, <laughs> like the, one of the Amazon tributaries here, which by the way, Amazonia in Colombia uh, covers 40% or almost 40% of, of, of our country. So this is uh, one of the reasons for the huge biodiversity actually this one. And then here is just one last very interesting uh, biology trait of, of the glass frogs of some species, not all of them. And it is this weapon. Look at this hook. They call it the, the humeral spine because it is pretty much uh, in the shoulders of the animal. And it is a little bone. It's not, it's not a cartilage or, or anything. It is a bone. It's a hard hook and uh, the males fight each other, not to death, they never kill each other, but they really bruise each other. Uh, according to some recent observations, they, they, can, they can really inflict uh, at least some pain or damage, uh, even if it is superficial. Uh, and uh, I used to have a video, but I don't find it anymore, of these two males fighting with their bones and the bones cannot get you know, latched onto each other and they fight underneath the leaf. So you see, 
you see the two male frogs hanging for dear life with one toe, with one little finger from the tip of the leaf, and they never fall. I don't know how they do it. And then they continue fighting on their, on their, on their side of the leaf like Spider-Man. It's really cute. So the, the sad part here is that uh, for all that beauty, for all that biology, for all that new information they're giving us in physics and, uh, and, uh, and in handling the light, they are going through, like so many other creatures, through, through, uh, through difficult problems. And those, those five are the main culprits, no? Habitat destruction for a lot of uh, times is agriculture when it is not for um, forestry, illegal or legal. Uh, then of course, diseases, uh, lots of fungi, uh, pesticides, of course. Obviously climate change is the big umbrella for everything. Mm. But of course, poaching, both legal and illegal, mostly illegal poaching for the pet trade and, and even for science. One of those little, Rare, uh, a rare species can fetch you around two thousand dollars for a thingy like this, uh, if you if you can if you can get out of the country or if you can sell it. So, I love this picture. Look at this. This guy is mimicking the spots on the leaf. <laughs> it's just incredible. So we can, in a little while, talk to Claudia uh, or to to each other about conservation, what can we do? But uh, this 2018 world map of agricultural land use is painting a picture that, well, the world has to be fed, but also where do we draw the line? How do we do it? How do we do it in a way that we don't uh, cause harm to, to the rest of the, of the animals in the environment? Easier said than done, no? But uh, let's see what it is here. In Colombia, we have uh, between 25 and 50 million hectares, and this was four years ago, of uh, land used for agriculture. So some people are trying to do something about it. They say, okay, as well, at least if we cannot stop climate change or forestry, let's try to breed them legally. How would that work? It's not easy. It's working a little bit because some species uh, need to be fed by hand uh, and they only eat eggs of that species that are not, uh, you know, that are not fertilized. And so this one, I love this little guy. It's, it's not a crystal frog anymore. It's not a glass frog anymore. This is just a regular frog in, in Colombia. It's called the oophaga because they eat, it, eat, it eats um, eggs. Uh, and this is a poisonous, uh, a poisonous little guy, um, one of the 12 species. And then there is this farm in Colombia that uh, is uh, raising them and selling them legally. It has been, they have been, uh, hmm, featured in several, uh, in several publications, uh, in several, you know, they have been patted in the back, but the demand is so much higher, no? There is still a little drop in the bucket for, for in terms of, of what they can do, but I can see that that is a, an interesting solution in, when it concerns frogs, you know, that not something you can do with a leopard or, or a bird, but with a frog maybe. So yes, as the International Union of Conservation of Nature, Natural Resources says, amphibians are facing a massive crisis. I was surprised to read that there's actually one third of the world's amphibians that are actually threatened with extinction. That is a lot. These guys are what they call an index, they're index species, meaning, meaning species that, uh, whose decline is telling us everything about our environment, frogs especially. Um, so many people are thinking let, let's, we're going to have to resort to ex situ management, meaning let's try to do something with them outside of the wild. Uh, this is what not only what the guys earlier were doing, but this is the zoo of Cali, the Cali Zoo, 
the city of Cali in the southwest of Colombia, uh, very close to two of the biggest biodiversity hotspots uh, in the country, uh, which is the, the Pacific Coast and the South. They have been declared the best zoo in Latin America. And they are trying to, to conserve, work towards conservation of some of the most threatened of these frogs. And so they have their, their interesting lab here and well, we'll see. It's gonna take time, but they are trying to do that and to eventually maybe releasing them, but they have to keep studying that. This is the, where they, next to where they work, this is the mountains of the Farallones. It's another hotspot is right there of, next to the Pacific coast and next to the city of, of Cali in the, in the Southwest of Colombia. And uh, all with the mountains, no, uh, help, uh, help change the conditions and help foster the amount of species that a country can have because of the difference in altitude and because of the amount of uh, holdings of geological structures. They really form different um, um, places to live and different uh, ecolo um, environmental regions. And so I'm finishing before this. It took me, what, like half an hour? We can sit down and talk. But before I finish, I want to let you guys with this, take a look at this photo. Which frogs in this picture would you guys think is poisonous? <laughs> and while you think about it, then we can probably start a conversation. Thank you, Angela. That was really, really <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> I learned a lot about frogs today. <laughs> I know they're amazing. They are really beautiful. Thank you so much. And there's so many, many things to reflect about the many things we still don't know about nature and in general and, and how we, we, how that knowledge can help us to understand better and how we create our relation with nature and, and what we want for the future. No, there's very, very interesting things about the frogs uh, reproduction, the farms and, and that So it is. Let's see, I'll just say, let's see what happens <laughs> in that front. <laughs> then we'll see. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I I think um, I might open the, the room for, well, first of all, uh, if people have a, already have a talk about the poisonous frog in the picture and anybody wants to jump <laughs> in <laughs> and, and share the stop post, sharing, yeah. Or put it on the <laughs> chat if you want. <laughs> Uh, welcome. Otherwise, um, please uh, ask any questions or if you want to have a, a conversation with Angela, it's not only about questions, just ask anything about uh, Angela's research. You're very welcome, please. Uh, feel free to, <laughs> to jump in. <laughs> if you... I'm, I'm, yes. I might just I'm ask a question myself. So I'm sorry, it's up here. I'll take myself off. Uh... There we go. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone who, who's joining us today. So if you do have a question, type it in the Q&A box um, and we'll be able to get to it. But I wanted to ask, um, so something that we've sort of looked at here, um, we've got a researcher, Ben Scheel, he couldn't be here today, but um, he's been looking at um, the uh, something called the cryptid fungus. I think that's somehow you um, say, it, Claudia, I mean, is that right? Crypto fungus? Yeah, yeah, so that's something that affects um, uh, quite a few frogs here in Australia, but it is international as well. Is that something that um, is found in Colombia and particularly with these glass uh, frog species as well? Claudia, I think, I think uh, as I recall, but I'm not totally sure, the glass frogs themselves still do not suffer from this fungus, but I think many others do. I do know that there was a massive death in Costa Rica of this of frogs like this. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard a while ago. It's like a white fungus, no, Claudia? What do you, yeah, what have you yeah. heard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not an expert on, on, on amphibians on frogs, but yeah, I think it's uh, my understanding is that the, it is, uh, has been recorded in, in Colombia. Not not completely sure how, what extent of the, of the impact, mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I think probably in Colombia, uh, as Angela was mentioning, so many of the traits are related with um, 
deforestation and land use change. And I think one of the, the links with climate change and, and with, the, with this uh, fungus that you were asking Peter was, mm -hmm. is that with climate change, it's, it's uh, amplified the potential mm -hmm. impact of this fungus in, and, uh, on the, on that it can spread broadly. And so it is, is a, is a big concern. And I think in, in general around the world, uh, amphibian researchers are very, really looking at, at that uh, at that and see how how can we we work on it yeah I don't know what would be I mean I think perhaps the habitat loss is a bigger threat but um, maybe the fungus can kill them faster uh, I'm not sure but I do know it's like a add insult to injury no that kind of yeah but i do yeah. think deforestation uh, and especially uh, for example in ecuador yeah, i don't I'm not too sure it's not the case in colombia in those regions that i showed you in the slides but i do know that in ecuador a lot of them are threatened by uh, mining because the mining is precisely for some reason that I can't comprehend. <laughs> the, the, the mining regions happen to sit right in the places of highest biodiversity. And some of these habitats of these frogs are not even, you know, what? One and two square kilometers period. For some reason you go to the next stream and that frog doesn't exist there anymore. So mm. some of them, some of the experts uh, that I talked to in, in Ecuador uh, actually are, are trying to see how to um, convince private people, private companies, even governments to buy little these little pieces of land and maybe make a corridor, an international corridor, like something like the Jaguars, the Jaguar yeah. corridor that begins in, in Belize and goes down to Brazil. So what do you think, Claudia, in terms of, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it's it's part of the the many efforts in in Latin America to that all these connectivity corridors alongside mm. national parks, and I think precisely in Colombia, uh, the Colombian government was uh, it's in the process of already proposing a, a massive mm -hmm. uh, corridor conservation corridor connecting the Amazon. Um, uh, Forest is uh, going to be one of the biggest connectivity corridors in the world, apparently, that is uh, aiming to connect bit forest between the Andes in Colombia alongside the, um, the Amazon toward Brazil, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru. So this is something that is a, a work in progress and requires a lot of international cooperation, but it's a lot right. of this concern about, especially okay. many concerns about illegal deforestation, illegal mining, and how this, uh, these things are going okay. to affect biodiversity in general. So the, and of course, frogs is one is probably, again, I'm not an expert on frogs, but I think it's, it's probably one of these very fragile because they, they require very specific uh, habitat requirements and humidity and things of this. With climate change and deforestation, yeah. it's going to make it more 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 difficult for them yeah it's going to make it worse yeah yeah um uh, I, I wonder if anybody has one, any question i i want to ha i i have a, a question is, more about the, curiosity I, yeah sorry i, I, think I see an I, I think i see a question by ambassador at Tortua. Ah. how can the common citizen help protect these species which is a very important question i think uh, well i do think Knowledge is power. Information is power. Uh, he or he should, who doesn't know, we just go through life and we don't realize. Um, knowledge helps because it helps us pressure our local governments, our national governments. But I also believe in what Claudia was saying earlier, international cooperation in, a, in, in, in the case of, of, for example, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Is something could be done. No, in that sense, when, when your neighbors, but the citizen himself or herself needs to be armed with power and maybe start from childhood. But, uh, but bottom line is we need to know the problem. We need to be familiar with the issue and with the science behind the issue, not just, uh, yeah, climate change is doing something. No, no, exactly what is going on. 
Uh, so it, 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 and the other thing is, yes, if you guys have beautiful frogs in Australia, how can we exchange knowledge as well? How can we go into one another's country and explore and see how can I, how can I take the knowledge that Colombia has in tropical systems and help apply to systems uh, in Australia, vice versa. This is why I love these chats uh, in Colombia's embassies because I am convinced that cooperation, international science cooperation needs to happen. It happens already, but it needs to happen more. <laughs> so yes, Ambassador Tortuga, thank you for your question. I, let's, let's, let's make this more, more known because this little tiny thing is, might be nothing to many people, but they actually are representing an entire ecosystem, an entire problem. And they are the, they are the flag of something big happening. So perhaps we need to make this, this, uh, these little frogs into an emblematic species, which it already is, because who doesn't like a glass frog that shows you her heart or his heart openly because they cannot hide their belly. <laughs> uh, children love them, <laughs> but yes, we need, we need to, maybe it's a matter of reaching people, which is one of the things I like doing through emotions, through descriptions, through, through the science, but uh, in uh, engaging the mind and the heart at the same time, perhaps. So to follow that up, um, Angela, um, one thing here in Australia that is part of the conversation is also the um, role of um, the Indigenous peoples relationship to the land and their knowledge of um, how it works and everything. And we uh, certainly see that with um, conservation of species, but also bushfire management, things like that here in Australia. In um, Colombia, is, um, what's the connection with uh, the Indigenous people's knowledge mm -hmm. there of these frogs and, um, and, and their uh, connection to the land? I love, I love your comment, Peter. There's actually a beautiful connection that goes thousands of years ago back to the Tairona uh, people who live in the Sierra Nevada in the Atlantic uh, Range, um, Atlantic Coast Range. They had uh, some of the prettiest the gold, uh, um, you know, um, goldsmith uh, work involves frogs, and for them the the, the dart frog, the poisonous frog, uh, not just there but also to the peoples in the Pacific coast were um, sacred, and they revered them and they still do. And yes, they do have the knowledge. Uh, I, in, ancestral knowledge of the indigenous peoples needs to be incorporated into, into science, into modern science. I do believe we need to work with them. I think in many instances, they are being talked with, but I personally don't, uh, haven't done so, but I do know that uh, their knowledge is uh, respected in many circles in Colombia. I don't know if there's any practical uh, results coming out of that, but I do know uh, that, for example, what they do with the uh, poisoning the, their arrows, the, the tips of their arrows with the, with the frog's skin has led a lot of researchers to start thinking into how to study those chemical compounds uh, uh, to work in um, antitoxins, in, in, in better, better studying the uh, structures of venoms for medicine. But these guys probably knew that a long time ago. So yes, uh, it's a matter of working with them. Uh, and again, I don't know exactly what we're doing, but I know we should if we're not doing already something. What do you know anything about this, Claudia? Any, have you, uh, of how the indigenous, uh, in this, in particularly with frogs or with amphibians, knowledge is taken into consideration in Colombian science? Uh, particularly about frogs, no. Um, no, don't know a, a concrete example, but I know that um, there is a lot of um, work ongoing on incorporate indigenous knowledge in management of protected areas. 
and to better understand the impact of climate change in protected areas and to better design uh, conservation strategies in protected areas. And I think indigenous knowledge in general is, is, is broad. It's not just the stuff of the frog or the bird. It, it, they have a more holistic <laughs> knowledge right. of, of the land. So this part right. of, the, of the approach they are doing is, is um, uh, yeah, I think it might, the, the only example I, I know is if, the one exactly you mentioned about the that frogs and the how they <laughs> that is is a, is amazing and that that made me also think about if you can share the photo again of the of the of the Which photos one? of the the dart uh, frogs of the poisonous okay. Where, okay, where, oh yeah the quiz you guys <laughs> we still you guys, yeah let's see okay um uh, yeah because it's, it's it's really amazing how the indigenous knowledge uh, indigenous people. Uh, <laughs> know how to collect the, the very poisonous frogs and they just put the the the, the dark and touch the, the, the dark to need to take the poison and then they go on and 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 for the hunting that's it is oh, really sorry. really amazing how that uh, I thought I was sharing but I went here I'm sorry let me share I was auto sharing that doesn't work <laughs> <coughs> Yeah. Because then we, we will need to know to find which one is the poisonous frog in that photo. <laughs> yes, let me see. Let me thank you for um, let me put this back up. <laughs> so what do you guys think in our audience? Let's have a vote. <laughs> Who is poisonous here? <laughs> I will say the red. <laughs> you say the red? What else? Is is that the only one? What about everybody put in the chat or <laughs> is, is our ambassador there? I love his vote. <laughs> yes, it's a, I mean, look at the skin. It's like, what is it about? Is it, is it it's obviously it's attracting, attracting the attention when, yeah, or is it yeah. not? Because it, isn't that interesting? Because if you're a glass frog, you want to be not noticed. You yeah. want to be it's, transparent. You don't, you don't These want to guys, be Exactly. And now this guy is apparently a glass frog, but these guys are not glass frogs. <laughs> so, they, so, yeah. So, uh, do we have, uh, let's see, let me here. We have another. Uh, let's see. Somebody said the one to the bottom right. So it's Mario. Oh, I think, let's see. The one to the bottom right. Uh huh. Okay. Well, um, no, Peter. guess what? Peter, <laughs> did, did, did Peter vote? Peter Rancho, the one in the bottom right hand corner. Yeah, also there. Ah, okay, there's another cure here. Wait. Uh, Peter Rancho. I think I think the one in the bottom right hand corner. You mean Peter this okay, wait. I think the you one in the with one? the mm -hmm. Anna Maria raise hand. Can we bring Anna Maria? <laughs> A ver, Anna Maria. I see three here, three three hands. <laughs> uh, so let me tell you which one. The red one is the only poisonous one in this photo. Isn't that interesting? You would think they were all poisonous because they all have that very flashy skin. Yet, no, just the red one. Isn't that interesting? It's it is. And Octavio says all the ones in the right half, <laughs> but the one in the square, and the red one and are poisonous. <laughs> Thank you, Octavio, but just the red one. But yeah, it is, uh, and that reminds me, uh, brings to my mind uh, of, um, a student of uh, Universidad Nacional, National University. No, actually, it was at Los Andes University in Colombia. She's another frog expert. And it was her first outing there into the Farallones Club, um, Farallones, Club Farallones Mountains, to um, collect uh, some of the frogs for, for research. And she collected some poisonous frogs on, on, unbeknownst to her. And then she <laughs> scratched her fingers, her, her eyes. <gasps> oh my God. And her, her, her eyes were just really swollen. And, uh, you know, she tells the story, she was so afraid. <laughs> but good thing that it didn't, uh, it didn't, didn't, uh, didn't, didn't go worse than that. But just with a smidge, because actually the dart frog, the, the, it's called the, uh, what is it? Something, something terribilis, the, the golden dart frog. 
Um, it, it, is it through the poisonous frogs? They get poisonous because they eat ants. That's one. I, I'm not sure. That's one. Uh, that's one. Uh, yeah. Um, idea I've heard. Probably. I I would have to find out. But since I was just working with glass frogs, I I'm not too sure. It could be though because remember the flamingos get pink because they eat that a little shrimp, and so that's why they get pink. It could be one of the one of the several uh, pathways of, of becoming poisonous, but I do know that some of those poisons are so strong that uh, it can kill a dozen person with just one little drop of that. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah, it's just incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so and this is another reason why they are so popular. Everybody wants the exotic pet. And uh, I think now they are either, either they are producing them or thinking of producing them without the poison. I don't know if that's possible or if eventually. Yeah, maybe the, maybe the diet, exactly. I think it's one of the questions that Peter Rancho was also asking I, if it's I, about the diet or what it is. So. I think you're right. I think it, it could be. I, I think I remember long time ago when I was at uni, they, they were talking about, uh, and, and actually at the Instituto de Ciencias Naturales and Science, uh, Natural Science Institute in Bogota, they had a dart frog in captivity and they were researching with that dart frog. And they were uh, trying to find ants to, to keep, keep mm -hmm. the, poison, the hair producing <laughs> poison, but they are not completely 100% sure how they, they they become poisonous. So, but anyway, I think it's, we are very close to finish. I don't think there are any more questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I can't see any okay. anything else. Um, but again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Anja, do you want to say any final words or anything? Sure. Else? Thank you, Claudia. Thank you guys for coming. I mean, it's it's always brilliant and uh, to, to, to talk to people across the, the world, across the ocean, across cultures, across everything. So I'm really happy to, to for this opportunity. And thanks to the Fenner School and thanks to the Colombian Embassy in Canberra, Ambassador Tortuga. Uh, let's, let's try to, to know, learn more about each other's uh, countries and environments. And perhaps one day you find yourselves Putting, setting feet on Colombia, and that would be lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Thank you very it was much. Really lovely to have you here. It was a very informative talk and beautiful, beautiful photos. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And thank you also to the Ambassador Atertua, the Colombian Embassy in Canberra, for Peter for helping us with all the communications <laughs> in the background. And uh, to everybody for joining us. And hopefully you uh, enjoyed the day and have a good day. Uh, Stay dry in Canberra and have a good night, Angela. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Take Thank care. You. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Bye-bye. No, you're welcome. Bye. <laughs>